We bring before the Lord these are gifts, our offerings, tangible and intangible. Physical offerings that maybe we dropped in the little box at the back of the church or we, we wrote a check earlier in the week and put it in an envelope. But also those things that we dedicate in our hearts. Those things where we offer to God who we are. Where we commit our resources. Physical resources, our, our emotional resources, our energy resources. That we in response to what God has done for us, not out of obligation, not out of an attempt to, to bribe him into some sort of special favor, not in a way to um, make, through our giving, atonement for our sin, that's already been done through Jesus Christ, but out of response for what he's done, to say, use me, Lord, for your kingdom's sake. And so we bring these gifts and we dedicate them as part of our worship, really kind of at the heart of who we are as we worship in response to who he is, hear, Lord, our gifts. Receive. Let's pray to you. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for what you've done through Jesus Christ. Thank you for doing what we could not do on our own. That we would never have the means, the ability, and perhaps even the right inclination to do on our own. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for the peace that he brings into our lives. And out of that peace, out of a, a humble appreciation for all that has been done for us, a price that we could never pay, we return a portion of our gifts, financial, time, talent, and we offer ourselves. And Father, we offer ourselves without strings attached. Use us. Use us in whatever way you see fit, that you deem to be appropriate. Allow us to connect to that, that person who needs to hear. Allow us to reach out to that one that needs to be remembered. To feel valued. That one who needs to hear a gentle rebuke. The one that needs to be reminded of your love. For those who are stuck in darkness, allow us to be one more light reflecting you. Use our gifts, Father. Use us. Allow us the grace of benefiting your name. We offer these gifts and trust them to you and willingly, boldly say, here am I, send me. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. It's number 168 if you're using a hymnal from Scotch Plains Baptist. Um, if you're using one of the worship packets, it's included right there in the middle. Um, if you are uh, attending worship and you really like using a hymnal, you're not sure if you're going to sit in that same pew next week. I'm encouraging you, if you, if you, if you prefer the hymnal over the worship packet, um, adopt a hymnal. Uh, foster a hymnal. Take it home with you, bring it back to church with you next week. Um, and kind of use that as, as your hymnal uh, so that we don't keep handling uh, the, those materials. It came upon the Midnight Clear, number 168. Let's stand if you would care to and sing together.
on this second Sunday of Advent, the Sunday that is often celebrated as peace. And I, I have to pause right there and remind folks, if anybody tells you that they know what each of the four Sundays of Advent are, take that with a grain of salt. There is no real definitive answer. Whether the candles are supposed to be blue or purple, whether the third one's supposed to be pink or not, whether the first candle is hope or prophecy, uh, whether the second is John the Baptist or peace, it's all just a system that people put together to try to help them focus their minds as they move towards Christmas, the coming of Jesus. Help them focus their minds as they move towards that glorious second coming. And so this year, and it might be different next year, this year we have first Sunday of Advent as hope, the second Sunday peace, next Sunday will be the pink candle, the merry candle, and that will represent joy. But on this second Sunday of Advent, the last half, the last line of that, that carol, when peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors flame, and the whole world give back the song which now the angels sing. Peace being flung over the earth. I, I, have you ever paused to kind of paint a picture of that? I mean, that's not, it's not peace being sprinkled or, or poured out, but being flung, spread, cast. What a glorious day when we could be flinging peace. Because let's be honest, there's a lot of stuff that gets flung around, and a lot of it isn't peace. What an aspiration we can have on this second Sunday of Advent. In just a moment, we'll join together in our pastoral prayer. Uh, but a couple of things I, I do want to point out for the, the good of the order, if you will, um, a, a potential congregational meeting uh, coming up on um, perhaps as early as the 12th, but more likely the 19th, I, I, I think. Um, many of you know that we, for years, have been dealing with a piece of property uh, across Grand Street here. Um, and uh, we, we are in the final processes of a final agreement with a, um, a builder, a developer, um, where we would be partners uh, in, in the building over there, again, not selling the land. Uh, but that would require a congregation meeting to sign, to sign off on those things. Um, and it's a kind of a, a hectic time of year to do that, but uh, we just got word that our attorney, uh, who's been working with us for, for years and has been working with this particular property for a number of years, um, is leaving his firm at the end of this year. Um, <clears throat> and we would rather tie things up with somebody who's been dealing with this than somebody else in the firm who will be taking it on and, and uh, being caught up to speed. Um, so keep that in mind as a potential meeting. Um, that would be in person here and also electronically. Um, by Zoom, if somebody uh, is not able to make it um, and the, the challenge of getting the core uh, under these conditions. Uh, so keep that in mind. And, and something um, a, a little bit lighter, perhaps, uh, on Saturday the 18th, uh, Wreaths Across America. Uh, many of you have participated here at Scotch Plains Baptist. Maybe you've participated somewhere else. I know I have family that have participated in, in other uh, locations. Um, this is a non-denominational uh, placing of wreaths on the grave of every veteran. Um, and so you most famously done in Arlington. Um, but done across the, the nation uh, at um, American burial grounds in foreign countries. Uh, ships at sea will actually place wreaths uh, for those lost at, at sea or buried at sea. Um, but Scotch Plains Baptist will be participating with our local veterans organizations uh, on Saturday the 18th at noon. Um, and uh, it's a, a, a brief service and then a simple placing 
great. Uh, and one of the things that is the hallmark of Roots Across America is a little phrase they use called say the name. Um, and so you might be placing the wreath on uh, the, the grave of a Revolution or a war veteran who has had no descendants, no family for 200 years come visit that grave. Um, so pause and honor uh, and say the name. Uh, again, Reads Across America, that's December 18th, here at noon. In just a moment, we're going to join together in prayer. And I just want to encourage you in a, in a couple of different things. Um, some things that have been, been shared already today. Um, some things that have been on prayer lists for a while. Um, but, but keep in mind, all sorts of categories. Physical, health. Um, we, we've got folks that are... are recently diagnosed with things and, and trying to come to terms with that. Some that are still testing, trying to figure out what in the world is, is going on. Uh, others that have under, been undergoing treatments and sometimes those treatments have to, to change and be modified or uh, a new uh, avenue uh, approach. Uh, so keep those things in mind. Um, and also mental health. Um, the, the recognition that um, that's often one of the things that we talk about the least, and it's one of the things that in our own personal care, we might attend to um, the least. Uh, so keep that in mind. We also keep in mind uh, financial health, uh, a very challenging uh, economic situation for a lot of folks. Um, and boy, we could, we could just stir up the pot because we can start talking about, well, why, if, if people are in economic challenges, why are there so many jobs open? And get into a whole, discussion about uh, economics and um, how things work together. And the bottom line is there are people hurting. Um, there are people who uh, aren't finding adequate employment and there are, are businesses that are, are losing money because they can't find people to do the work that they need to have done. Um, and we recognize there's a, a lot going on in there. Um, also, uh, relational health, uh, family, health um, and, and individual health, those who, who feel isolated, and those who feel isolated even when they've got people under the same roof. Um, and, and the whole life cycle of families. The stresses that come from marriage, from birth, from um, death, from aging, from uh, being the bookend generations dealing with uh, parents and children and sometimes grandchildren uh, and feeling squeezed in the middle. Uh, those who feel like they're being left out, those who feel like they're not being given an opportunity, relational health. We have a lot of issues to be praying for. And then in our, in our careers, whether as, as students, uh, as volunteers, as paid employees, there are stresses. And everybody kind of looks at everybody else and says, well, I I would gladly trade mine for that, um, but would you? Uh, would you really? Um, and recognizing that it might not seem like a big deal from your perspective, but for the person who's dealing with it, it's a big deal. Um, things you say, oh, well, I, I, would just, I would just let that go. It's a lot easier said than done. And so we recognize there's all of these different layers of who we are, all these different elements that make us up, and that any one of them might be a little more stressed at one time than another. And then in the core of it all is our spiritual health. I mean, we, we have to be able to talk about that at church, right? Our spiritual health. And we sometimes see it as very cut and dry. You're either lost or saved, and that's the end of it. Um, but we know there's a lot that are struggling a lot that are seeking, a lot that um, are, are dealing with this, is there really a lost, saved issue? And our call is to help understand that. There's those who say, well, I, I, I've made a decision for Christ, but you know, I've been hurt by the church. I've been hurt by Scotch Mines Baptist Church, or I've been hurt by another church, or I've been hurt by how Christians in general are portrayed, how those who claim to be Christians have acted, and I'm kind of burned out or turned off by it. Those who say, well, I've, I've been part of the church, I've been part of the same church for so long, and I'm just weary of some of those little things that outsiders don't see, but it's just piling up on me, that 
are hurting me in my spirit. And sometimes we confuse the things of the church, capital C, the things of Christianity with the things of God. And the recognition that if you've been hurt by the church, you haven't been hurt by Jesus. You've been hurt by people claiming his name. And we are a flawed people. I am a flawed person. Uh, even before you get to me being a flawed pastor, I'm a flawed person. I'm a flawed Christian. And so I do hurt people. It's not my intention. Uh, and I would dare to say that most people who have been hurt by churches, it has not been anybody's intention to hurt them. But we recognize that our spiritual health can sometimes be hanging on by a thread because of what's been going on around us. And sometimes it gets to the point where we have just seen so much, experienced so much, suffered loss, seen death and chaos that we start to say, is he really paying any attention? Am I just going through the motions when I participate in my spiritual practices. See, our, our spiritual health isn't just a simple yes or no, flip the switch. It's a continuum like so many things. You have children in your family or a brother or a sister or your parents who you're not sure have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe they're churchgoers. Maybe they've said the right things, but you're not sure. Or maybe you've seen them move away from the faith. And maybe things that they claimed 20 years ago, they now have claimed to wash their hands up. We have a lot of spiritual health things to pray for as well. And so we bear all these things in mind. And then we add in the headlines. And news reports. And things in our social media feeds. The things that Somebody texted us midweek, and they weigh on us. Let's offer all these things in prayer. Holy God, thank you. Thank you that we can come to you in anything, with anything, for anything. Father, well, there are times that we start to think that my, my thing isn't worth it. That my issue is, is not worthy of coming before you. That it's too small, it's too common, it's too everyday. Forgive us of that. We know that you count hairs on heads. You've named the stars. You know when a sparrow falls. There's nothing in our lives that's insignificant. Father, forgive us those times when we think it's too big, it's too much, it's too late. That whatever we've got going on, we can't bring to you. Or maybe we start to feel, well, once I get this done, once I do this, then I'll be ready to pray. I'll be ready to take, Father, forgive us all of these attitudes that keep us from you in prayer. Allow us to still ourselves before you. Remove the safety devices we put in place. Remove those little hidden areas where we've kept something aside. Free us from those things that would keep us away from you in prayer. And allow our spirit to be invaded by your spirit. That you would hear the very prayers of our hearts in words that we could not begin to express. And for our troubled spirits and minds, may you fling peace. May we take into ourselves your peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, we pray together. Amen.
in Advent, we tend to read scriptures that we've read before. We come back to the same ones. And there's a side of me that says, man, we got to we got to mix it up. We got to shake things up a little bit. But there's another side of me that says, but no. There's something to be said for returning to these things, to be reminded, to be reminded that they are foundational to who we are. And that we can tweak a little bit, that we can have a different perspective, look, look from a different angle and find something new without throwing out these things. And where it's, where it's kind of, in my mind, coming from is this idea that um, you probably have traditions around this time of year. And, and if you, you've been around me for a while, you've heard me talk about traditions. I talk about traditions a lot. I, I have traditions and systems and a way, ways of doing things and when you can and when you can't. But I bet you have some of those too. I bet you have a tradition around your Christmas tree. When it goes up, how it goes up, whether it's artificial or it's got to be fresh cut or you can buy it from a lot. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, we've done all those things. We've gone out and hiked the field and crawled under the tree and cut it down and tied it to the roof. And um, I've picked them up from Gray's Forest. And, and it seems like every time I've, I've gone to, to Gray's, I, I've walked up and looked at the tree and said, that's a nice tree. And I've looked and spent half an hour looking at other trees and come back to the first one I looked at, and that's the one I bought. In our home right now, if you were to walk in my house, there are five artificial trees set up and decorated. Maybe you have a way that, of um, putting out your nativity and where it goes and when it goes and whether or not the wise men are there, whether or not baby Jesus is in there until Christmas Eve. You, you have traditions, don't you? And maybe there's certain music you play. Actually, in our house, there's a tradition about what um, CD has to be played uh, as the very first Christmas music post Thanksgiving. Um, it's a very specific CD. You got to play through the whole thing, and uh, somebody has to sing through the whole thing. Um, maybe there's a Christmas special that you have never missed. And even when your children have grown and left the house, they're watching it at their house and you're watching it. You've actually called them and reminded them that it's coming on tonight. So we can come back to the same scriptures and kind of find the same comfort in them. And maybe see them from a different angle. Matter of fact, those of you that can, can see how the sanctuary is decorated, you'll see some things that are familiar and some things that are a little bit different. And if you can see where the, where the Christmas tree is located, it's the same Christmas tree we've used for a number of years now. Um, and last year it was up here next to the, uh, the baptistry. Um, and so this is the second year it's been there. But it's always been over kind of behind the piano under the big stained glass window. But it's kind of the same tree. Some of the decorations are a little bit different. Uh, you, you might see on it blue poinsettias, which, let's face it, you don't see blue poinsettias, but I bought them years ago and have used them when we've had a blue Christmas service. Um, and with the modern blue of Advent, it um, goes very nicely. The Advent wreath is very similar to the ones we've used for the past number of years, sometimes the little decorations in them have changed. The candles, I'll be honest with you, are literally the same candles we've used for three years now. Um, we just keep modifying them a little bit to make them work. The porcelain Mary and Joseph figures that sit on the baptistry rail beginning with the first Sunday of December, not the first Sunday of Advent, and Jesus does not show up there until Christmas Eve. Those are the ones that were here before I got to this church 30 years ago. And so we see what is familiar, but maybe arranged in a different way. And that's kind of how we approach our text. It's familiar, but we see it from a different way. 
We begin with um, Zechariah. Uh, I, I said sometimes the second Sunday is John the Baptist Sunday in, in churches. Uh, and our, our texts today kind of talk about the things of John the Baptist. Well, it's really appropriate to talk about John the Baptist when we talk about Advent. We're talking about coming, uh, about the coming of Christ, because that's what John the Baptist did. He talked about Jesus coming. So let's see uh, from Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 67. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. That's one big run on sentence, by the way. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for Him, to give His people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew, became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, prophesied. He spoke what was yet to be, but part of that prophecy was reclaiming the prophecy of days before of what had already been said about God's promise and about His covenant. But now he says that in this child, in John the Baptist, some of these things will be completed. Some of these things will be undertaken. Some of these things will be moved forward. You will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for Him. To give His people knowledge of salvation, through the forgiveness of their sins. I mean, could you ask for much better than that? And to shine on those, though, skipping this a little bit, but to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. You're going to let folks know about the light of Jesus shines in their darkness and guide our feet into the path of peace. And that last phrase is really one of where I want to hover for a moment. Guide our feet into the path of peace. On this second Sunday of Advent, as we think of peace, the recognition here that John the Baptist was starting a process. Guiding our feet into the path of peace. He was just guiding us to that path. He wasn't bringing about that peace. He wasn't the peace. He wasn't the path to peace. He was kind of pointing the way. And I have to tell you, I take some encouragement there. Because it takes the weight off of me as a follower of Jesus. That I don't have to be peace for anybody. I don't have to make them peaceful. If John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, the one who gets the ball rolling, that gets people ready for their introduction, if all he has to do is guide feet into the path of peace, 
That takes a lot of weight off of you and me. We don't have to convert anybody. All we have to do is guide their feet to the path. That's it. Guide their feet to the path. And that takes a bit of pressure off, doesn't it? But it also puts a little bit of pressure off. Because I think that like John, we are called to do just that. Guide feet to the path. So then we have to look and see, and what of the things that I'm doing, and am I helping people get to that path? Or am I a hindrance? And so people, people want to be inclined towards that path. Am I kind of pointing the way and helping them get there? Or am I kind of a roadblock? Am I kind of a, a, a gatekeeper saying, well, I'm not sure that you are ready for this. Maybe there's something you need to do before you come to this path. And so maybe there is a little pressure here, isn't there? So look, are we actually guiding feet? Or are we tripping people up? This idea of peace, when we, we pretty much all claim that we want it, but what are we doing about it? Maybe it's just me, but I have a tendency to see the other person as the one blocking peace. You know, there would be peace if they would just do or if they would stop doing. And maybe in that, I'm a pothole on the path to peace. Maybe I'm the speed bump. And so I think this Sunday, as we hear the words of Zechariah about John, we can hear a call on our lives about what we could and should be doing. Now we're going to jump ahead in our text to Luke chapter 3. The first six verses. And again, some familiar verses. And you probably read them, or at least hear them read this time of year, every year. Some of these words you've heard sung. Some of these words you have sung. Some of these words you can't help when you hear them, you hear them musically. But beginning with verse 1, In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iteria and Trachonitis, and Lysidius, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. And some of you know that you sang that. See, this is what John was doing. He was calling for folks to get about this business, prepare the way for the Lord. See, he was preparing the way by telling people to prepare the way. It's part of what he's doing. But he was leaving the work to the people. Just like guiding their feet to the path, he's calling them to the work that must be done. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. I mean, that's, that's some work. Every valley shall be filled in. 
It takes a lot to fill in a valley. Every mountain and hill made low, it takes a lot of work to make those things low. To take what's on the mountain and put it into the valley so that a straight path can be made. Crooked roads shall become straight and rough ways smooth. And all the people will see God's salvation. I think in here, we need to see a call on our lives. A call to us to be about that work of making it easier for folks to get on the path. And sometimes we're called to tear down a mountain and sometimes to fill in the valley. And sometimes to straighten that road out to smooth things out. And sometimes that work is best done in ourselves. That we need to kind of knock off some high spots and fill in some low and smooth out some of the bumps in who we are. Preparing the way for the Lord. Setting folks' feet upon the path. And through this, all people will see God's salvation. I think this second Sunday of Advent, this Peace Sunday, is a good opportunity for us to look and see what am I doing to help the cause of peace. Not enough to sit back and wish for it or daydream for it or to complain about a lack of it. But to be doing the work for it. The work of peace. There's a song that, again, many of you being in, 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 in a certain demographic might remember this song. Cat Stevens had it in 1971, Peace Train. Um, certainly fits in that, you know, again, kind of think what was going on in 1971. It fits in that whole era of peaceniks, hippies, anti-war protests, of those looking for a better time, of those saying, look, we've, we've marched for civil rights, but we've had some success, but there's still a lot more to go, and there's a lot of people in the way. Cat Stevens wrote Peace Train. It um, didn't make number one on the Hot Billboard Hot 100. On, on their easy listening, it did. It, it actually became number one there. On the, um, uh, they used to call it the easy listening. Now it's the adult contemporary chart. But it was his first top ten hit. And he had, he had a lot of good stuff. And um, I don't know about anybody else knowing on Cat Stevens' album or two. Okay, I might be the only one here. Um, I had a lot of good music. Peace Train spoke to an era. Again, 1971. Here, these words. Now I've been happy lately, thinking about the good things to come. And I believe it could be something good has begun. Oh, I've been smiling lately. Dreaming about the world as one, and I believe it could be, someday it's going to come. Because I'm on the edge of darkness, there ride the peace train. Oh, peace train, take this country, come take me home again. Now I've been smiling lately, thinking about the good things to come, and I believe it could be something good has begun. Oh, peace train, sounding louder, glide on the peace train. Come on now, peace train. Yes, peace train, holy roller. Everybody jump on the peace train. Come on now, peace train. Get your bags together. Go bring your good friends too, because it's getting nearer. It soon will be with you. Now come and join the living. It's not so far from you, and it's getting nearer. Soon it will all be trio. true. Oh, peace train, sounding louder. Glide on the peace train. Come on now, peace train. 
Now, it's easy when you sing that to, and, and it is a singable song. And when it comes on, some of you, again, it's right in your wheelhouse. You sing along with that. It comes on to the oldie station. It's easy in that to overlook the fact that he's talking about a train that is coming. It's not quite here yet. Even the kind of the positive stuff, stuff being talked about is positive in it's happening, not it has happened. In fact, very again, I've been, I, now I've been happy lately thinking about the good things to come. I believe it could be something good has begun. I believe it could be someday it's going to come. Um, sounding louder. Uh, get your bags together because it's getting nearer. Getting closer. <coughs> but as upbeat and positive, there's also a little tinge of negative coming up here in these words. Because you recognize it's something that's moving, it's something that's coming, but it is not here yet. And maybe it's not coming as fast as I want it to. The next line says, now I've been crying lately, thinking about the world as it is. Why must we go on hating? Why can't we live in bliss? Because out on the edge of darkness, there rides a peace train, a peace train, take this country, come take me home again. And then he goes on to some of the familiar words. But right there, kind of in the middle, he started with, now I've been happy lately, but here in the middle, now I've been crying lately, thinking about the world as it is. It is not here. It's coming. I think John the Baptist would understand Cat Stevens. Prepare the way. Let's get ready. Let's do these things. But in the meantime, look and see, we're so far away now. There's so much more to be done. And there's folks who aren't willing to put the work in. Folks willing to see it happen, hoping that it happens, but not willing to put the work in. I said that was in 1971. In May of this past year, for the 50th anniversary of Peace Train, uh, that song was made into a children's book. Creatively enough entitled Peace Train. Beautiful illustrations. And it's just the words that Cat Stevens wrote 50 years ago. And they are appropriate words for your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids today. There's a peace train coming. And we need to get on it. Now, I want to be honest about something. Cat Stevens, between 1971 and 1921, hasn't always had the best reputation. He's been called out for some hypocrisy. He has said some things that are challenging. Some things that perhaps were taken a little bit further than what he had said them to be. And some of the things that he took stands on that he later had regretted. And it's easy to dismiss Cat Stevens. To throw him out. To throw out Peace Train because of some things he said. But again, I think that points back to you and me. Because we claim the name of Jesus, we claim the things of Christ, we claim to be followers, but we have said things that are hypocritical. Things that perhaps we hadn't thought all the way through before we said them. Maybe actions that we undertook that in hindsight, boy, we had really stepped off the path when we did those things. But we know that we can get back on it. We know that Christ hasn't rejected us. That he calls us back. And frankly, there, there might have been 
Some days where, where Cat Stevens jumped off the peace train for a moment. But I think if you were to hear his words today, he'd tell you, I'm still looking to get on board. And I want people to join me. It's a recognition that the train isn't the destination, it's getting you there. Just like Zechariah talked about John guiding people's feet to the path of peace. And maybe this Sunday of Advent, as we think of peace, we think of it as a process, and we think of where we are in the process, and what we are doing to move the process forward. Are we helping to smooth the road? Are we helping to straighten things out? Or are we going to be part of the problem? And I think that's a worthy thought for this week. I think it's a worthy thought as we approach communion. Here at Scotch Plains Baptist Church, this is our first Sunday, and it's our tradition to have communion on the first Sunday. If that just snuck up on you, you're here at the sanctuary, and you didn't pick up some communion supplies from the table, it's all right if you get up right now and go get them. I'm not offended. Maybe when we're singing, you'll get them. As we're moving towards communion, we recognize that we, if we're, if we're taking communion together, hopefully we understand what that represents, what the cup and the bread are. We understand what Jesus did and we've accepted it as our gift. And we've begun that process, but maybe in that process we have stepped off the path. Maybe we have gotten off the train for a moment. Maybe we haven't lived up to our expectation, let alone his expectation. And we don't need another sacrifice. He's already died for all of our sins. But maybe if we go to communion, it's a reminder that we just need to put our feet back on the path. The path is still there. Maybe it's a reminder that while we have been part of the hypocrisy, the train is still there. And we can get on that peace train. Maybe communion is a good time to make peace again with Jesus Christ. To make peace with who we've been and where we've been and make the decision to move forward. Back on the path. Back onto the tree. In just a moment, we're going to sing our hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And then from there, we're going to go into communion together. Um, Little Town of Bethlehem is number 169 in the hymnal. It's also in your worship packet. Before we get there, let's pray together. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for an opportunity to pause and be reminded of the call that you have on our lives. The task you have before us. Help us to be reminded that we don't have to do it all. But we're called to do something. Help us get our feet right. Help us to... Use our feet to lead others, to guide others to your path, and not to trip them up. And Father, if today our feet are pointed in the wrong direction, by your grace, allow us to turn around and get on board. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. O Little Town of Bethlehem, number 169, if you're using a hymnal from Scotch Plains Baptist, otherwise in your worship packet. If you're able and would care to, I invite you to stand as we sing together.
be seated. As we go to the communion table, we take the bread. We're reminded that Jesus, who came as the Prince of Peace, took the bread and he broke it. And he told his disciples that it was his body broken for them. His body broken for you and I. The Prince of Peace broken so that we may know peace. Do this in remembrance. And from the table, he took the cup. Perhaps the, the cup known as the cup of redemption. A cup of warm red wine, a reminder of the hot blood of the lamb that was the sacrifice, the Passover lamb. And Jesus, the Prince of Peace, let it be known that there would be no more need for sacrifice. No repeated sacrifice, no annual sacrifice to take away our sin. Because His blood, the blood of the perfect Lamb, was the only sacrifice we need. We just have to accept it. And He called on His disciples to do this in remembrance. In just a moment, we'll have the benediction. And we'll be invited to leave. I say invited because I'm not going to make you leave. You can sit here all day if you want. But we're invited to leave, taking with us the blessing of Jesus Christ as we go to be a blessing to others. An understanding from the Prince of Peace as we go to guide others to that path. To invite others to join us on that peace train. Not everybody's going to want to follow. Not everybody's going to get on board. But that's not our responsibility. Our job is to guide them to the path. Let them know the train is coming. And welcome them. To join. A little bit earlier today, Alice came in and she used one of my phrases. She came in and said, I'm going to do something a little bit different today. Host Luke's going to be from the piano. I invite you, if you would care to, to rise for the benediction. And now, as you leave this place, go. Go seem to fling peace, to call others to it. And to walk in the way of peace. Go, guide others to the path of peace. Let them know that the peace train come. Go, in the name of the Prince of Peace, be a blessing and be blessed. Amen.